All right, let's let's call the uh, May meeting to order. Uh, I'm Virgil K7 VZ, the vice president. John's uh, playing hooky tonight, so uh, left me in charge of everything here. So uh, we'll go around and everybody introduce yourself. Go first. Name and call sign. Take the mic. Hi, my name is Evan, and my call sign is Kilo Kilo 7, Mike Golf Lima. Name is KC7CS, Mike N7MW, Lake Y7M, Rick W1 Hotel Zulu, Bill Alpha Alpha 4 Quebec. Steve, K7, Sugar Papa. Ray, N6VR, and W7YA. Uh, WA0KDS, Ron. Uh, Norm, N9AV. Brian, W7JET. Walt, NJAG. Thomas, NE7X. All right, yeah, tonight uh, we're gonna go right into our, our presentation. We've got uh, Tom, NE7X, and uh, Ray, N6VR, are gonna share about their Mars operation in Vietnam. Uh, it's an older presentation that they've done before but we we talked them into coming back i know i was telling guys my dad served in vietnam and it's a completely different place than the way tom describes it so um, very interesting presentation if you haven't seen it before so uh give us a second we'll transition and, and get him set up here oh i'm sorry let's do introductions to the guys on zoom i'm net a 7 a Bob NA7RH. I'm Steve N7TX. Mike, it's K7ING. I'm N7RD. I'm here, but I don't see myself. We see you. Oh, kf 7 e all right, thanks. Sorry about forgetting you guys. Uh, anybody else on Zoom? Okay, Tom, uh, you can go ahead. Ah, there we are. Okay, confirm that they can see it. Can you guys uh, see the presentation on Zoom? No, I can. Yes? I, I take that as a yes? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Thomas. My call sign is November Echo 7 X-Ray. Yeah, I'm going to give a presentation of my little holiday in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. <laughs> uh, next slide. Okay, so a little bit about who I am. Uh, I got my ham license when I was 15 years old. So I was a ham before I went into the Army. Uh, I had to call uh, WN8NSH, WA8NSH out of Ohio. And uh, so that's just a little bit about me, but go ahead. Next slide. So at age 15, I got my novice. Uh, 60, in 1965, I got my general. So I was pretty active uh, as a ham. I went to all the ham fests. I did CW. I chased DX. And, you know, I was a real active ham. My father was a ham, so we had a father-son combination. Uh, after I graduated from high school, uh, I decided I wanted to go into the military. So I decided to go, well, it was kind of interesting. I wanted to go to the Navy. So I went and saw the Navy recruiter. And the Navy recruiter, I said, hey, I want to go to radio school. And the Navy recruiter said, no, nah, can't promise you that. So I said, well, okay, well, I don't want to join the Navy then. So I walked out of the Navy office and I walked down the hall and the Army recruiter. So I poked my head in there and I said, hey, if I join the Army, can I be a radio operator? He says, yeah, come on in. 
let me sign you up right now. So I bought it hook, line, and sinker, right? I was gullible. So I joined the Army. So that's how I got into the Army. So what they did is uh, after basic training, um, I went to Fort Knox, Kentucky. In basic training, they were going to send me to Nike Missile School. And I go, whoa, wait a minute. I was supposed to go to radio school. And the, the sergeant said, well, who told you that? And I said, the recruiter. And he goes, oh, yeah, right. So, <laughs> so he said, go over to building whatever, five, and he said, take a test. So I went over and took the test. It was like a radio amplitude test. I maxed it out. So they said, oh, gee, you've got a high score. We're sending you to radio school. And I go, yeah. So they put me on an airplane and sent me to uh, uh, Fort Ord, California. And I went to Fort Ord and learned basic radio, how to operate radio, just what I wanted to do. So I already knew Morse code. And they were, at that time, we had to know Morse code. But I already knew it. I was up 20, 20-some 20 words a minute. So guess what I wound up doing? I was on KP. <laughs> Everybody thought I was a smart ass, right? But I already knew code, so... Anyways, after I graduated from radio school, then I went to advanced radio school in Fort Gordon, Georgia. Uh, so I went to Fort Gordon. And after Fort Gordon, um, I got tied up with these airborne guys, and we were going to go jump out of airplanes. And I decided, uh, I don't know if I want to jump out of an airplane. So they said, well, what are we going to do with you? And I, so, uh, I said, do anything. I don't want to jump out of an airplane. So they said, OK, well, how about going to Vietnam? And I said, anything. I don't want to jump out of an airplane. <laughs> so they sent me to Vietnam. So, so that's, that's how I wound up going to Vietnam. Next slide. So uh, anyways, during the Vietnam War, there was no telephone, cell, cell phones. There was no internet. Not, this, that high tech stuff wasn't here. Uh, so there was a thing called the Mars system. And then Mars is, of course, military amateur radio system where they would type HF radios or whatever teletype equipment and they would communicate. And that was a form of communications. So uh, when I got into Vietnam, uh, that was the, as it says at the bottom, the soldier's telephone company. That's how they made telephone calls back to the state. Next slide. So, uh, when, after I got out of Fort Gordon, I get off the airplane and uh, they sent me to the 9th Infantry Division. I get out of the airplane, I'm on, on in Vietnam and they put me into a what they call a holding company or a department or battalion or something, trying to figure out where to, where to sort me out and put me. So uh, uh, I was in this holding company just kind of waiting around and they said, oh, you're a radio guy. So they gave me a PRC-25, put it on my back and gave me an M16. And said, guess what? Go out in the rubber trees and walk the patrols. I said, oh, okay. You're a radio guy. You carry the radio. So I said, well, this isn't the kind of radio I was really hoping for, but okay, next slide. So anyways, the 9th Infantry Division was in the south part of, of Vietnam. It was down in the uh, rice paddies. You've probably maybe seen pictures of Vietnam where everybody's walking around in the rice paddies and the swamps. Well, that's where I was. I wasn't in the mountains. I wasn't up in the highlands. We were down in the the swampy d delta uh, was uh, like the Everglades of Florida. It was just, just mosquitoes and bugs and lots of moisture and water. So we were in south of Saigon. Go ahead. And this is kind of what it looked like, you know, the soldier here walking around. That's, it was just the big swamp. That's all it was. It was a big swamp. Lots of monsoon rains, everything. That was very enjoyable. <laughs> Next slide. So uh, the 9th Infantry Division was in a place called Bearcat. It was south of Saigon. That's a picture of it. And that's where the 9th Infantry Division headquarters was. That is not the Mars antenna. That's some satellite antennas or telephone that the generals got to use. This is just a picture of the camp. Go ahead. So now here's a picture of me. So after I got out, I was, like I said, I was walking around doing patrols. I got to carry the radio. That's me at 19 years old. So I was on holidays. I was like, wow, this is really cool. You know, I'm in a different country. I've never been out of the United States before. This was actually quite exciting. I, I kind of enjoyed it, actually. Stupid as I was, but naive as I was. Uh, anyways, 
So I was carrying this M16 and this radio and doing night patrols in the rubber trees and rubber plantations. So that was that was my whole thing, waiting to figure out where I was going to be stationed full time. So uh, after about two weeks, I got this uh, day off. They gave me a day off and said, hey, go down to the PX and get some toothpaste or go get a beer or do something, your day off. So I'm, I go, I'm walking around by the, the PX and I look up and I see this big TH7 antenna up on a pole, telephone pole. And I go, wow, that looks like a TH7, right? So, and I, saw, I see this sign called the Mars station. And I said, Mars, okay. So I go in and I said, I think I'll send my, my dad was a ham. So I said, I'm going to send my dad a Mars message. Let him know that I'm okay. Everything's good. Once I get my final mailing address, I'll, I'll pass it along. But so I filled out this Mars gram and I addressed it to my dad's call sign and I signed it with my call sign. And I gave it to the sergeant behind the desk. Master Sergeant Lee, W6RDH. So he's proofreading it and he goes, Oh, you're a ham operator. And I said, Oh, yeah. He says, He says, Wow. He says, I'm short an operator here. How would you like to work in the Mars station? I said, Ooh, well, gee. <laughs> yeah, of course, right? So he said, I, Go back to your temporary unit and let me see what I can do. So, funny thing that he pulled the right strings being an E9 sergeant. If you, you guys were in the military, E9s are the big guys. You know, They're the ones that can pull the strings. So next thing I know, he pulled the strings and he assigned me to the ninth signal of the battalion, full-time operator as a Mars operator. So that's, it was kind of just the luck of the draw. But I always, I always joke around. The funny thing I always feel is being a ham radio operator, it saved my life in Vietnam. You know, I could have been out on patrols every night and who knows, running into Charlie or whatever, but instead I was in the Mars station. So ham radio saved my life. Next slide. This is a picture of uh, Master Sergeant Lee here. Uh, and this is my captain, he was in charge. The call sign we had was uh, AB8AU. That was the headquarters for the 9th Infantry Division. Next slide. So this is uh, Master Sergeant Lee. This is at station number one. Uh, yeah, the call sign. It's interesting. That's the call signs they gave us. Uh, it wasn't uh, the ABs, the alpha calls were not given out in Vietnam or before Vietnam. They were always Ws, Ks, or Ns. The As were not given. They were strictly for the military and the Mars operation. But this, yeah, as you can see, we had Collins S, S lines. And then we had a little scoreboard up here on how many um, uh, QSOs we were, foam patches we were running. So and we have a little window here where people would come up to the window and they would fill out their little request for the, for the uh, foam patch. Next slide. And there's me operating station two, PLC, 19 years old. Here I am operating the Mars station. Uh, had the Collins S line. To, what else can I say? I was a kid in a candy store. You know, you know people talk about, you know, Vietnam. I'm, I'm sure there was a lot of really tough time for a lot of people, but I was a kid in the candy store, man. I was, I was living, loving every minute of it. Next slide. This is that antenna that I saw across from the PX. This was my beacon. When I saw that antenna, I said, yeah. <laughs> so, so this was Dong Tam. So the 9th Infantry Division had two base camps. They had the main base camp uh, just outside of Saigon. And then they had the, the Dong Tam, which was down in the rice paddies in the swamp. So my sergeant in his wisdom said, we need to send you down to Dong Tam because uh, we need somebody down there that knows what they're doing. Because they had a couple guys that were running the Mars station, but they weren't hams and they were just kind of, yeah. And my sergeant knew that I knew what I was doing. So he kind of said, you go down there and square things away. So he sent me down to Dong Tam. Uh, Dong Tam was an interesting place because it was a joint operation of the US Navy and the United States Army. And the reason is, is you've probably seen some movies where these green river boats would run up and down the river. They were like the water taxis. So the army guys would get on the green river boat. The Navy would shuffle them down into the Delta. They'd get off the boat and they'd go on their patrol or whatever they were doing. And then at certain times, the green river boat would come back and they would rendezvous and get back on and bring them back to base camp. So the Navy had this taxi service, I guess, for the Army. So it was a joint effort between 
uh, the Navy and the Army. That's these two symbols. So it was a joint operation. So when we were looking for a Mars station to set up, they we didn't really have a place. We were kind of, you know, in this little, uh, wasn't even a hut. It was just like a, one of those cargo containers. So we, we talked to the Navy and we said, hey, is there a place maybe we could set up? And we thought we could put up a big antenna instead of just having dipoles and stuff. So the Navy said, yeah, well, you can come over and we got an empty building on the Navy side of the place. So we kind of wound up being in the Navy. We had our Mars, Army Mars station on the Navy side of the camp. So we got to eat in the Navy mess halls and did everything on the Navy. We were the only Army guys on that side of the, of the base camp. Uh, next slide. So that was about the river boats. Go ahead, next slide. So this was some of the Navy boats. You can see these are those green boats that would run up and down the river and, and do the patrols. Uh, you can see they have guns on the front. This was a uh, repair barge. That, that ship did not have an engine in it. Uh, it was a barge that had machine shop where they could repair all the engines and boats, and lathes and drill presses and everything to patch all these green river boats back together. This was a cargo ship that came in to deliver some some goods that came up the river. Next slide. Uh, they also had these uh, big um, barracks as these were the, where the Marines st stayed. We were on land, the Army was on land, but the Navy ran these big um, Navy ships and these were actually like big um, sleeping quarters for the United States Marine guys. They would live on, on the board ship uh, and they would go on these green boats, these little green boats and they would do their patrols and then at night, Instead of coming back to land, they would come back to these ships and they would they would have bunks and stuff on the ships. So next slide. So this is our Mars station. This is where I spent the good good part of my life. The backside of this here is the Navy Communications Center. That they have their antennas up here, and then some more antennas up here. They would talk to the Green River boats. And then we had our Mars station in the front of the building, and then we had our, our poles here with our tri-band beams and stuff on them. So um, th this was kind of a shared area. And you can see we had our sandbags and everything to keep us protected for what it was worth. Yeah, next slide. These are our, our operating stations. We had co all Collins equipment. Uh, we had three, three different uh, stations. This is interesting, the six megahertz station was a real interesting because we would talk to all the other Mars stations in the country. Uh, and we would talk with Thailand too. Uh, so on four, we'd get basically on six meters and we'd say, hey, I need a 6146 or I need 50 feet of coax. And we, oh yeah, I'll trade you the coax for a microphone or whatever. You know, we would make these barters and these trades. And uh, so we'd have these weekly nets on six meters with all the other Mars stations. Next slide. So I got promoted to uh, E4, e a specialist equivalent to a corporal. So here I am in, in, in Dong Tam. Notice we have air conditioning here. Well, we were high tech. We had air conditioning going. So uh, man, I can't, it's amazing I was that young, right? That was, I think I was approaching 20 years old at this time. Next slide. So here I am again. I was the only one that knew how to keep things going. So I'm working on Collins equipment, doing repairs. And it's, it's funny, this is a staged picture. Uh, my sergeant brought in a, a professional army photographer because they wanted to, there was a magazine or newsletter that went out to all the 9th Infantry Division to, and we wanted to promote the Mars and let everybody know that, hey, you can make phone calls back to the States. So they put this article together in this local news, army newspaper. So the photographer would come in and he'd say, okay, you need to stand there, don't move, you know, and he would take my picture. So that was a staged picture, but it went into the uh, Army uh, news magazine to, to invite people to come to the Mars station. Next slide. So this was uh, the sergeant that was in charge uh, for the Delta. And, and the only other the other only other hand was this guy, W0CEC. He was a ham from Iowa. Uh, so him and I became real good friends. The other guys weren't hams, but they were basically hams in spirit. You know, they were real good operators. They ran a lot of phone patches. Uh, Pat was from um, Visalia. Uh, Yoshi was from Los Angeles. And Sergeant Harris was from Washington State. 
And uh, John Deering here was from Iowa. Next slide. So this is uh, our the Rough Riders. So it's our group, the hardcore hardcore Mars operators of AB8AZ Alpha Zulu. So funny, it's Arizona, right? Alpha Zulu. I didn't, this was before I moved to Arizona. So that's that's our Rough Rider. This is our barracks. We we're on the Navy side, so we had our own barracks. This was this was my bunk. I took the top bunk. And the, it would rain and rain and rain. It was a swamp. So this would all turn into mud. So we had these wooden sidewalks that we all walked on. And then we had our cleaning ladies. They'd take care of, a, they'd clean up our, do our laundry. They'd polish our shoes and keep our bunks square away. And, you know, for pennies, you know, we'd give them pennies and they, they, they would take care of everything for us. Next slide. So now this was the Mars station here. And you can see it, our, our beam antennas and our, and, and this was the dock. Remember that one picture where the cargo ship was docked? This was where the cargo ship and those green river boats were docked. And uh, this was the Mars station with, uh, you can kind of see the antennas here in the background. So these are our antennas. We had uh, three different ut utility poles. We didn't, have, we didn't need rotors. Didn't have to have rotors because the antennas were all fixed on the United States. So uh, we had, uh, and look at the frequencies we operated, 14, 4, 88, 27, 827. 10 meters was open during this time of the, this was in 1968, and we had great propagation on 15 and 10 meters back to the States. I mean, we were just rolling and running, you know, 20 over nine signals and running these foam patches. Uh, foam patches were all, Basically, five minutes, we would give everybody a five minute call, maybe six minutes, depends on what, what they were trying to say. And everybody would uh, come in, they would fill out a little sheet with their name and who they wanted to talk to. And we would have an operator on the other side that would establish and make the phone connection. Next slide. So in order to make the Mars station work in Vietnam, we had to have Mars stations in the United States. So these were our points of contact. Now, a lot of people say, did you talk to Barry Goldwater? Barry Goldwater was Air Force. We were Army, so we did not cross militaries. So what we had, we had a guy here in Phoenix. I don't know if anybody knew him, uh, WA7NNL. He was real active. He was on with us almost every day. I never knew the guy. I never met him, but he was real active. Then this other guy, Al, up in uh, Oregon, WA7FTN, he was between between Ned and Al, those guys were like 24-7. They were just, they did, they donated, dedicated their time and ran, I don't know, thousands of patches with us. And of course, we would get into Honolulu, Bakersfield, California. And, and when the bands were so good, we'd even get into uh, uh, occasionally into Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. We would, that, that wasn't regular, but we could get into Fort Monmouth on 10 and 15 years when the bands were really open. Next slide. So this is the pictures of Ned and Al. This was their stations when they were running the Mars station, talking to us running the foam patch traffic. Next slide. So now my sergeant got an idea that, hey, you guys are living too comfortable here in these air-conditioned Quonset huts. Um, there's a lot of soldiers that are, who are out in the, in the field, in the bush. There was these things called fire support bases. And the, what the fire support bases were is all along inside the um, uh, rice paddies and the delta and the swamp, they would ha have these little artillery camps and they would honeycomb all across the, the delta so that if the infantry was out there and they needed uh, cover, they could shoot artillery and give cover to the infantry guys. So these little FR uh, field fire support bases, they, they would have anywhere between 50 to 100 guys. And there was probably, I don't know, like 60 or 70 of these scattered all throughout the South Vietnam. So my, sarg my sergeant said, hey, we need to give these guys a phone call. They, they deserve a phone call too, not just the guys that are at the big deer, you know, base camps. So we, we, he commandeered this ambulance and we gutted it out, took all the medical stuff and all the bunks and the beds and everything out. And we filled it up with Collins radio equipment. And we found a generator and we towed the generator and we had a 30 foot push up pole with a 15, I think we ran 15 meters at the time. Uh, and we got, he said, you're going on field day. <laughs> so he said, take off. 
So we, we, we would take off and go on field day. So this, this was the, uh, it was called the Dodge M53 ambulance truck. We had a 10K generator. And what we did is, like I said, we would just drive all around uh, South Vietnam, going to these little forward artillery camps, these pork chop hill kind of uh, outposts. Next slide. So this is kind of just a picture of the unit, the, the truck set up. Next slide, just some more pictures. This is our generator that we towed. Next slide. So in order to get approval to do this, we had to go to the general. And so we said, let's, let's make a phone call for the general. Let the general run a, a phone pass to his wife in Hawaii. So my sergeant said, make, make it happen. So he, there I am, I'm with the general. I'm like frozen, I'm with a two-star general, right? I'm only an E4. And I'm going, oh my God, I got a general here. He's talking to his wife. I better, you know, be cool, right? So General Connor, we ran a phone call for him on 20.83 uh, megahertz. He talked to his wife. And after he talked to his wife, he gave us a stamp of approval and said, go, you got my approval to go out in the field and run these phone calls. He was really impressed with what we were doing. Next slide. So this is inside the ambulance. We had a little sign up here. We had our KWM2 and a 30S1, 30L1. Uh, and we had the auto patch. And uh, we had our antennas. We had, a, we had our six meter, one of those, remember those Collins antennas that were like a tape measure? We would put those out so that we could get on our six meter net. Because my sergeant and everybody wanted to know where we were. So we would get on six meters and we would be able to talk back to Dongtam or Bearcat and let them know where we were. And then he would give us our assignments where, where the next fire support base we needed to go to. So we would go to these fire support bases just enough to give everybody one phone call. And then we would tear down and drive to the next fire support base. Uh, next slide. So th this is it. This is some, this is, this is our antenna up here, our 15 meters on a push up, And like here we are living, we're brushing our teeth. I mean, this was our home. So, you know, and then we're hanging out here waiting to make phone calls and we would put, give the guys, put them on the mic or whatever, and they would talk to their wife, their mother, or their kids or whatever they would do. Next, next slide. These are just some pictures of my road trip driving around in Vietnam. This is kind of what the, the Delta looked like. It was just lots of water. You could see lots of swamp, straw huts, you know. People were real friendly though. I always thought the people were real nice. Next slide. You can see the armored personnel carriers here along the road. They would protect us. They would set up these bridges to keep Charlie from blowing up the bridges. So they would uh, sit at the bridge and make sure that Charlie didn't come up with any kind of dynamite or anything and blow the bridges up. And uh, so they would put these little uh, uh, guards and stuff around. And these are just the pictures I took out of the front windshield. Next slide. As I said, we were in the swamp, we were in the Delta and we'd get in rainy days. And uh, you can see the truck here, Mars One. <laughs> that was our truck. And you can see we were stuck in the mud. I mean, that was, and this was a four wheel drive vehicle too. And we had to have the uh, armored personnel carrier here come in and hook us up to a tow rope and pull us out. I mean, it was just, when, it, when those monsoon rains would come and you're in the Delta, it was just, everything would just turn into mud. But, you know, hey, that's just life in the Delta. Next slide. And you can see how there I am with all the mud on my boots. That was just the way it was. You know, everything was muddy, muddy, muddy. I'm in the back of the Mars truck here operating. I don't look too happy there. And, you know, this is a little reminder. Of we were actually in a war. And um, we were driving down the road. And... I, I thought a rock hit the windshield. You know, just, you know, something kicks up and you get a rock, boom, cracks the windshield. So we get to the fire support base and the guy goes, oh, I see you got sniped at, right? And I go, wait, oh, sniped at? And he goes, yeah, he said, that's a bullet hole. <laughs> so I said, oh, gee, that's a bullet hole, right? So, yeah, I guess it was. So I remember, because I remember the rock, I thought it was a rock. I swear today, I thought, I'm driving the truck, right? And I just, oh, a rock hit the truck. Yeah, right. That doesn't, not a rock. <laughs> so um, 
This is uh, at the fire support base. This is these, these artillery that they had where they would set up, like I said, they would honeycomb, they would shoot and give uh, coverage to the infantry guys. This was uh, one of our sleeping quarters. These were um, wooden crates that the uh, artillery ammo came in and we would fill them up with dirt instead of using sandbags and we would build these walls uh, in, in place of sandbags that were just crates full of dirt. But then we had our bunks and everything in there. And you can see here's our antenna. Um, we put up our 30 foot pole for the antenna in the artillery. Those things would nighttime blow your eardrums out. And you know, the artillery would set, you could see with it all swapped, they would put the, the mud and everything in there. And it was just the way it was, you know, it, good old times. So, anyways, that's at the end of it all. I got an award from General Abrams. If anybody knows who General Abrams is, there's a thing called the Abrams tank. You know, it's, it's still used today. Well, General Abrams gave me an award. Next, you'll see my award. There's my award, and it's signed right here by General Abrams, thanking me for my Mars service in Vietnam. So I thought that I've got it in my ham shack today in a nice frame hanging on the wall. So this is just uh, Washington, D.C. That's picture me. Of visiting the Vietnam Memorial. So all in all, that's pretty much my, my slideshow. All in all, I, it's a funny thing, but I actually had a good time in Vietnam. Um, I was naive and stupid, but playing with radios. And I tell you, it was more fun putting smiles on people's faces. You would be surprised on how happy they were these guys were fighting the war and they would be able to talk to their mother or their wife or their girlfriend or whatever. It was the most rewarding thing to see the, the look on these people's faces after that five minute phone call. You can't put a price tag on it. And it was all due to ham radio. That's it. No, it's on. Hey, Tom. Yeah. I get that that window with the bullet hole in it to make your frame for the certificate for your shack i need your thumb drive again it's saying your files corrupt corrupt well i didn't get a good copy on it i need texas comment okay save the bullet yeah i i didn't know where the bullet went yeah Okay, are you you're on just tell them to stand stand by. We're getting your presentation out. Okay, uh just said stand by, we gotta reload the yeah, my other my program. All right, I have a question for Tom. Yeah, yeah. What were the years that this was going on? What years were you there? What years were you there, Tom? Sixty seven? Oh, okay, yeah, uh, six nineteen sixty seven and sixty eight. Okay, I was in the Philippines at the same time, so, okay. So I started down south in July. I was there for oh, a couple of weeks to get reassigned. I was, the communications, I was field wire. I'm telephones and lines and anyway my first assignment uh, out of July was in a place called Hawk Hill uh, well let's go uh, Hawk Hill landing zone center was on top of a hilltop and we supported the grunts and and then in Da Nang next when I and and that was a Mars AB8 Alpha Delta we called them hooch mates. They came in and cleaned up and cooked for us at times and hit all the. Oh, you're, you're sounding broken up and garbled to me again. I don't know if anybody else is hearing the same thing. Okay. Can you guys hear okay? For the moment. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I, I tried to, I'm changing a different receiver. We're having some, it's disconnecting the mic for some reason. Try CW. <laughs> <laughs> did it, did it, did it. <laughs> 
it always gets through. Uh, first assignment was the landing zone. Um, it was the support base for the troops, the grunts that actually went out and did patrols. Okay, okay. All right. Um, so we had mortars just at uh, mortars and uh, 105 millimeter cannons. Uh, and I was in communications again. Go ahead. Uh, area of the Vietnamese village, uh, all traveled in the, in the north was by Huey helicopter. And this is a typical village. There's all the rice paddies. Next slide. This was some of the bombing that was done. These are potholes filled with water. And that's the bomb they used to carpet bomb these places when the, the VC or the NVA was around. Next. This one's landing zone LV Center. It's about 200 foot wide and about a thousand foot long. Uh, most of the occupation was here. We had a firing range here and then they'd bring out ammo that got contaminated. And whether it was not contaminated or not, they blew it up about once a week. And they'd, they'd, sign, the, they'd sign the siren and then out down and boom, boom. And then you just tinkle, 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 tinkle all over the place, stuff falling down. But that's, that's where I lived for about three months. Uh, next slide. This is on the Mountain Road. And Mountain Hill wasn't so muddy, but we had a lot of, a lot of rain. Uh, typical uh, living facility. This was the communications for the Mountain Hill stuff. They're all bunkered into the cut into the dirt. Uh, big pumpkins, six by eight by eights and eight by fives, all fanged up and then snap bags everywhere. Uh, I don't know what else to say. This was a mini motor uh, that shot all the time. You talk about noisy, too. Those things are really noisy. Um, it was covered because we had a three week long typhoon. It just rained and rained and rained. There was nothing dry. Even the, the bunkers that we lived in there, they had liner over them, but they dripped too. And the only place the only place I could warm my socks up is I put them inside my shirt. It's the only place I could warm up socks. Otherwise, everything was all wet. And these are the ammo, uh, ammo, ammo containers. Once in a while, they'd fire a rocket here, but it never got attacked by the uh, Red Kong or anything like that. Next slide. During this uh, monsoon, we had no source of food, no water. Once in a while, it would break enough disabilities, and the Chinooks would come in and bring in water. And these big, this is a, I don't know, 500 gallons worth of water. That was our drinking water at the time. Uh, and I mentioned that they were needed to live off of the three weeks we were there. That was it. Next. Uh, my bunker was here. You can see sandbags, sandbags, ammo cans, sandbags. Uh, you just walk in, they're, they're all timbers, you know, and you walk in down, down a ways. Next slide. Uh, this is a razor, a lot of razor wire, claymore mines, and trash. People just dump stuff over there. It's a foreign country. They're in a war, war zone. You're not too concerned about cleanliness. Next. Uh, this was LZ Center perimeter towards the South China Sea. South China Sea was about 20 miles away. Uh, the grunts would leave here. They had trails and they'd go patrols here all the time. And we'd, uh, the mortar came and the mortar there would shoot it. They'd call in support. Once in a while, the Phantom 16 jets would come in and drop napalm, but didn't see that too much. I was there, this was 1971. Things were relatively secure for the American soldiers there. Uh, wasn't a whole lot of action because we had things controlled fairly well. Next. This is interesting here. You can see this all just cleared off, cleared off. This was rice paddies in the distance over here. The area had been defoliated years prior with Agent Orange. And us and the troopers and stuff, the grunts, particularly the infantry, went through all this stuff. So you hear in Vietnam, a lot of guys are affected by uh, Agent Orange. And it gets it gets your body everywhere. Luckily, I've so far I've been okay. I wasn't in there too much in the in the pushing uh, out and around though. Next, then I went to a place called Hawk Hill. 
10 miles from the coast. Um, I didn't do any Mars operating from the LZ Center. There was no Mars station. I was just there for communications, keeping up the, the rigs and the antennas and make sure everything kept going. Here, I came came into and I was able to bring to uh, a uh, Mars station. This was a forward base, about 200 troops, quite secure. We had some rockets shot at us occasionally, but nobody was ever hurt. This is where I was, I got Mars radio, and it was AB8 Alpha X ray. This is one of those masks that the Army has that you put in a launcher and you clamp them together. I don't remember what they're called. Uh, and that was a log periodic. That's what we had there in Hawk Hill originally. I got there the, the first time I got there. We have Collins gear. You'll see this here. Collins gear with a 30S and a, a Henry 2K, I guess it was. The 30L1 was just no tuners in it. It was just SCBR would jump all over the place. The SCBR was like four to one. And I said, this is not right. And here, these in these places, most of the operators were, the Mars operators were inexperienced. They didn't really know anything different. A lot of them were cooks that were there to try to finish out their term or truck drivers or whatever. So there was a need for people that knew what they were doing. So anyway, this antenna, I followed the coax out and on top of the bunker here, I see a big ball of tape around the coax. <laughs> and, I, and I tore it down. I told them, I, you know, don't transmit here. And they had the braid attached to the shield and the shield attached to the braid. That was their splice. And I cut them off, put connectors on it, and boy, the SWR went down to 1.1 1 .1 or 1.2 to 1 and helped our signal out greatly. So, yeah, next. Uh, this is different, a different view. Now, this was a lot of rain and mud. Uh, this was a lot flatter area than what uh, the LZ Center was. Uh, we had a gun position up there. We didn't have to use it. It was a quite secure area. We still had to do uh, nighttime uh, bunker duty and i don't remember what that okay here uh i knew the high gain 204 ba our main frequency was 2655 i converted it using the old w6sai handbook and i i i don't know had a just plain old pocket calculator and figured out what the elements were the length was and back then we didn't know any different we just equally spaced the elements so that was just for the one our main frequency and boy that really helped out too we had a booming signal into the u.s next and there's another shot here's these gun bunkers positions here we didn't have any machine guns here or whatever we just when we had uh guard duty we just had our m16s next this was the entry to our mars station it was a sliding plexiglass the guys would fill out a forum and we'd get a number from them we didn't do too many phone patches from the facility itself, from this site here. We had landline on this on this hilltop. Well, it wasn't quite a hilltop, but a uh, Hawk Hill. And we'd call people, say, okay, uh, like Tom says, we'd send a list of five people to an operator, wherever she was, she could be was anywhere in the country. We were patched through from either hams to the state side, then they'd hook up to the telephone operators and we'd give them five calls and they'd come through and say, okay, your number one's online. Here it is. So we had a phone, we'd push in, push it in and connect there. And they'd be, we'd give them a heads up notice, you know, you're going to get a call back in about 10 minutes. And we allowed about five minutes and it was just uh, health and welfare, nothing, nothing secure. If there was any deaths or serious things happening, the Red Cross took care of that. So next. Okay. I don't know. I skipped around here. This is our, that's that's our my bunk. Well, no, not that's the the site there that we had to uh, uh, we maintained it for guard duty, and we had grenades packed away there if we needed them, but never had to. This was my my wallpaper <laughs> travels that I've been around through Africa and Europe and whatever, uh, and we had cockroaches, cockroaches galore. You just got to the point where you pushed them off and kept going. And there I was, 26 years old, and we had a dog, our mascot. Our perimeter fence was down about here, and this was a small little 
I wouldn't call it a village, but there was some growing, planting growing there. We were afraid that the, they call them sappers, they'd come through and sneak through the, the uh, Constantine wire, razor wire, and sneak up there. You couldn't hardly tell them unless you were really watching. We didn't have night vision gear, and they'd set up to go somewhere and blow up things, but we, we kept a pretty good eye on them. Next. There I am again. That's our station. Find me anyway with all the bunkers. Next. This was from our, that bunker looking out at, at the, our perimeter was over and through here. We had lights that we could turn on. Oh, and there's a, down on the bottom, view of rare Vietnam iota in the background. I've been an iota person. I'm on the Iona honor roll. I've got over 1,100 islands. Um, and I don't know. I think I've worked this one here, but under that was a lot, lot later. But I didn't. I knew what iota was, but I didn't know the islands. Next. Okay, we moved to Da Nang. We took over the first Marine Corps division, N zero E F D. They used the Marine Corps used N's for their call signs. This is the station we took over. Uh, they had a log periodic. There are some tower sections. We were going to put that up, but we never did. Uh, entry right here, and there was a waiting room here. You could make calls here, but most of the time we did calls. They were in another building. They, they were on a perimeter. We had field phones, and we actually ran phone patches with the guys talking back to their wife or family when they were in a in a bunker in a pulling guard duty. Next. This is the uh, yeah the log periodic. Up here was the general's quarters, and on the other side of that hill, maybe six eight miles, was a hot spot. Marine Corps would watch it all the time, but the VC would get in there, or the NBA, North Vietnam Army, the VC Viet Cong, and they'd fire rockets to try to hit that. They'd come over and land different areas around us. We had them two or three times. We had rockets hitting there. Uh, none of them were enough to, no damage. It was not open, maybe 500 feet away or something like that. But they wake you up in the middle of the night. <laughs> okay, next one, next slide. Okay, then I was trying to convert another 204BA, and I never, never had to test gear. And I realized later that the antenna was too low to really do any test that you couldn't get the SWR right or matching or whatever. But that was a Marine Corps tower. And if I got it working, I was going to put those towers up. Looks like 25 or 45, Rome 25 or 45. But we had a good location. This was the building itself, too. Uh, Call of Hooch, or um, well, what else? There's another name for them. But the sandbags are there to keep the wind from blowing and lifting up the uh, tin. Uh, tin sheet, sheet metal tin, because they would, they'd go all over. And there was a lot of wind in this area, too. And we were on a bank, you can see. Next. This was the inside of our operating position one. Um, we did everything with phones, basically. And this one was a control I would, we would use. The lids were up. I don't think we had air conditioning all the time here. So they were up to keep things cool. Uh, there's an amplifier, I guess it was over here. But we had the, this is the uh, KWM2s with the VFO and the uh, output meter. Next. This was station two, there's a Henry 2K. Uh, same radio setup. I guess it would have been 20 minutes to eight in the morning. Next. This is a third station. We didn't, our problem was we didn't have enough stateside people to be able to connect to, so they had to connect to the telephone system. Uh, so we didn't run these three stations at the time. We were lucky to run either one or two. And they're just, we were in a, in a net. I think the Army had seven nets from north to south Vietnam. We were in the stations up in the northern area. And we were limited. We could probably maybe pass at times only 20, 20 or 30 sections in the morning, morning propagation. And if the band's open in the evening, we'd get there too. Next. They had an RTTY station for Marsgram. I never, really never got it used, but you could send like 
Tom said you could send uh, greetings to a relative and it would get, it would get, I guess, transmitted stateside, then it would be distributed throughout the U.S. and then somebody would call or telephone. I really don't know how that worked. We didn't use it much. Uh, okay. But when things were hot, we could run 200 patches. We had enough people, enough stateside stations to, to accommodate us. Next. Oh, there I am. My, my uh, M16. Next. This was the backside of that building. Our showers were right here. And I think on the other side, we had a drum. But if you wanted a shower, you had to get two five-gallon jerry cans, dump them in there. And that was, you know, if you left it in there long enough, it might warm up a little bit. But otherwise, they were kind of cold showers. Okay, and we slept back in here, the main building. Oh, there is an air conditioner there. I, we might have had one for the whole building. Next. Oh, and these are our, our two two hole burnouts. And this is where you pitched in. You could, you know, take a, a BM back in here. And yes, the pisser, the pisser is in use. That was me. Somebody wanted to take a picture of me. Next. This is the way uh, waste, garbage, sewage waste, not garbage, but sewage waste. They'd fill them up with 55, about half full. You'd drag them out of the bottom side of these uh, latrines. You know, you had a wooden, two wooden cutouts to sit in, and then these drums were underneath there. So you drag them out. Typically, the military hired the Vietnamese to do this. They drag them out. Not always. If they didn't show up, we'd be out there dragging them out. You put a diesel in them, and let them burn, 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 burn. Next. This was uh, from our site here. Uh, they had, the Army had a big communication site for all palm and satellite stuff up and down the coast. Uh, that was a restricted area. We couldn't, we couldn't get there. Next. This was right down from below us was the Skorsky helicopters. And they made a lot of noise, but they heavy lift stuff. And they were neat to see those old things. Are Skorsky still around? Big, big helicopters. Another pitch. And next. And this is how they prevented, you know, if there was an artillery round or a mortar or a rocket come in, they try to, you know, set, you know not uh, so that the damage wasn't so severe. Next. And this is a typical Huey. This was about, Oh, maybe a half a mile from our facility. It was a landing area. If you wanted to go somewhere, this is what you took. Uh, they did have QL1. That was their highway. But like Tom showed, they had border checkpoints and they had guards at certain areas so that the, the VC couldn't come in and blow stuff up. Otherwise, you traveled, if it was just 20 miles or 150 miles or 200 miles, this is what you took. And there's two machine guns there. And if you wanted to, you could sit there with your finger, your legs hanging over. It was no big deal. <laughs> Next. And this is a, a slick. We call them a slick. I don't know why. They were, they would spot targets. You know, the Viet Cong were, there was a firefight going on. They'd, they'd spot the targets. They'd draw in the fires. And then the big gunships would combine them, come by, behind the, the Hueys. These guys were shot down quite a bit. They were... I don't know, lined up with some kind of uh, protection, you know, armor protection. But boy, they, they'd go down. There'd be a fight. They'd go down, and right behind them would be a, a gunship or two. Next. Now, this is from Da Nang, uh, from our site. And this was Da Nang over here. We were still probably oh, six, eight miles from Da Nang. And, and it's just a big, big city. It uh, has been a big, big city. It always was. I just look here, all these hooches with the sandbags on them. I don't know what this was. Next. This is kind of the same view at nighttime. Next. Oh, the Da Nang Amphitheater near our Mars station. We were back over in here on the other side. Bob Hope and many other groups would come there and, and entertain. It was really neat. And that, that could hold a couple thousand people. And a lot of lot went into those things there for morale for us guys. Next. 
Okay, I think this is near the end. These are the stations, AA6USA, that was Presidio. Tom referred to that. We used to patch the AA7USA, Fort Lewis, Missouri, Fort Riley, Kansas, Fort Dix, Fort Rucker, Fort Sill, and then war. That's the Pentagon, Mars Station. Then we had civilian people in Bakersfield, Shafter Bakersfield, a guy. These people were husband and wife here. One of those two were always on the radio accepting phone patches. Uh, these guys, oh, I visited these people. They, I visited all these people. I knew them. They weren't too far from where I lived at the time in Ventura. But um, they were there all the time when the conditions were were worthwhile. Uh, next. Oh, this is the end, but this is left over. Click, click it again. Who are these guys? Can you recognize them? Reinhardt. Yeah. This was after the DX convention, 1979, from Frank, W6KPC's house. And there he had a something like almost a 200-foot tower. This was a six element 20 meter Yagi that was going to go up. He was going to have a four square of these things. He's the guy that started uh, Triax Company. Any questions? Go ahead and click. I think that's the end. Yeah. Any questions? So I left there and came back discharged. Uh, went to the oh, the Marine Corps was leaving. The, they were vacating. You know, the Marine Corps, the you know, the bloody and guts. You know, they want to go kill everybody. You know, and they did. We had things. They had things under control. So they were leaving. You know, in 1971, things were quite secure. Uh, until so what seventy three when the NVA started coming in blowing up things, um, yeah, that was it. Okay, about, thank you. you. Ever use Barry's Goldwater Station? I didn't see his name up there. Air Force. Oh, he's the Air Force. Well, uh, it's coming out of here. So oh. ask them to ask them again. Yeah, ask, uh, the question again, please. I, I just wondered if Barry Goldwater ever got into the Army or. or uh, other than that, besides Air Force. You're no, uh, we never. Oh, the question. Any other? No. No. Uh, the, the, the services stayed to themselves. The Marine Corps was, I know there was one station at MCRD San Diego, kind of near where I grew up. And we didn't cross with them. The Army had ours and the Air Force had their own. We didn't, we didn't uh, help each other out at all. Hmm. Okay. Thanks. Okay, stand by while we transition here.